Subscribe to The Honest Critique for current affairs, movie, book, and product reviews. Also, make sure you press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the video series are solely those of the individuals and do not necessarily represent those of The Honest Critique and its employees. The following video contains strong language which may be offensive to some viewers. Viewer discretion advised. Uh, Lord Desai is a world-renowned economist, a member of British House of Lords, and an emeritus prof professor of economics at the London School of Economics, where he taught from 1965 to 2003. Lord Desai is out with a new book, The Poverty of Political Economy, How Economics Abandoned the Poor, which takes a critical introspective look at the bodies of thought that have driven economics across the world from Adam Smith to John Keynes, and from the Great Depression to the collapse of Lehman Brothers, Desai studies the contribution of economics to domestic and international politics. Firstly, congratulations on the book, sir, and thank you so much, sir, for taking your time and speaking to us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so I... Must, sir? Yes, sir. Be honest critic, but you must be a merciless critic. <laughs> Noted, sir. So I'll start with the questions. So, sir, your book has been inspired by real world events such as the COVID 19 pandemic, which brought attention to the struggles faced by the marginalized. Could you elaborate on how these events influenced your decision to write The Poverty of Economics? Well, you know, for one thing, I, all my economics career, I have believed in the possibility and the benefit of redistribution, uh, you know, away from the poor, uh, take money from the rich, give them to the poor, construct a more equal society, and so on. Now, obviously, I want to do it in a democratic setting, so it is a social democratic view. Now, I found again and again that. Uh, Governments, especially the British government, which is what I know very well, uh, happen also American government. Or when well, India is having a budget session, the focus is on how much would income tax be cut. You know, everybody, everybody all, all the Indian get gatherings of the budget which I have attended, everybody says, what, what will the middle classes get out of this budget? Nobody says, well, what will the poor get out of this budget? And then people said, at least in the UK, well, we must cut income tax to restore prosperity. But when anything happens, they say, we must cut the welfare spending because welfare spending is actually ruining the economy. Now, this contrast that economic prosperity means giving more money to the rich, or at least taking less money uh, from the rich, and uh, so taking away money from the poor. Uh, I, I couldn't understand how this particular set of views had taken such a deep hold on economic thinking. Because this is supposed to be sound economic policy. So I was at home in the pandemic, I had nothing else to do, so I thought I'd better look into the history of economic thought for these ideas. Where do these ideas come from? And I had all the books on my shelf, so I started reading. And I look at it not in Adam Smith, who I, I, as you will see from the book, I'm very fond of Adam Smith. He has very universal sympathy. He's very much in favor of uh, reducing poverty. But it came from Malthus and Ricardo, the two principal political, English political economists, who basically everybody thinks are kind of the founder of political economy. Because uh, it is this. Marx was supposed to have followed uh, Ricardo, and Malthus, of course, is known as a great guru. So I found out looking at the context of their economics, that basically it all had to do with the way poor relief was financed in those days. This is late, late 18th century uh, uh, Britain. And the law was that in every parish, every village parish, the parishioners had to maintain all the poor. 
but the poor they went first of all paupers who could not work because they were too old and they were disabled or there were, there were women with children and so on. They had to be maintained from rates collected, collected by the church, the church collected rates. And then there were workers who got a wage from their employers, from the landlords, because mainly it was agricultural work. An idea was that the wage is always sufficient to bring in a family. In the, and it's basically measured in terms of how much bread they could buy. Uh, and that was the main thing. Uh, a man and a wife and his children had to have this standard wage. Now then inflation happened in the 17, uh, uh, late 1780s and the paupers were obviously provided for by higher rates, but then when the wage, wages did not rise, they decided to collect more money from the parish for the wages. That is when Malthus, who was a, a clergy in, in a church, in an Anglican church, he decided that he had to show that giving more money to the poor was counterproductive. If you give more money to the poor, they will only have more children. So he invented, I say invented because he gives no evidence for it, this uh, idea that population grows at geometric rates, you know, two to four to, uh, to eight. But food, food uh, output only grows at arithmetical rate, one, two, three, four, five. And therefore, if you give people a little more, more money, very soon there will be overpopulation and starvation. Now, it's very well interesting that you know he wrote five editions. There are five editions of the book, Essay on Population. While he was living, it was shown that his population predictions were wrong. There was a, there was a census carried out. But he never ever admitted the falsity of his theory, but he always maintained his critique on the poor rates, how the poor rates were counterproductive. And his friend, David Ricardo, who was one of the greatest economists of all times, a great master of logic, he adopted that and he more or less incorporated the idea that wages are, as it were, as a fixed by iron law. Wages could never rise uh, beyond the minimum amount uh, so required to maintain the workers' family. In a way, if wages rose, then it will it will affect profits because the wages and profits and rent rent went on increasing because when population increased, agriculture went to inferior lands and therefore the rent was always increasing as against profits. When wages were not constant, they will definitely lead to profit and that will that will ruin the capitalists basically. So that that sort of uh, argument, and because David Ricardo was a very clever theorist, became very fixed in the imagination of the people who were the policy makers. So I started asking, where does this idea come from? So then I traced it to the politics of those days that basically in those days, only 1% of the adult, adult male population had uh, a right to vote. So parliament was full of very rich people. Uh, I mean, you, you have to pay a very high amount of income tax on the rates to be able to qualify to vote. So basically parliament, the politics was very much in favor of this way of treating the poor, because the poor were outside the prison. And Given that that became uh, a policy, for instance, something called the poor law, when when you know when the franchise was in the slightly was called you know the great uh, electoral reform, 1832 again, things did not change very much. So I thought, okay, there, this is an inversion of the usual idea that economics determines politics. Here was politics determining economics. Uh, which, which is which is sort of a which is idea I I started pursuing. 
And so I went through how franchise in, in England increased through many uh, movements of, of, of voters and people who are not franchised. And so by about the 20th century, early 20th century, uh, during the First World War, finally all adult males got their right to vote, franchise. And all women over 30 got the right. And that is when actually economics begins to discuss redistribution. That is, so my idea was that it required adult franchise, an extension of franchise, changing the nature of the parliament when the parliament began to work for the poor. And this is when uh, a man called uh, Pigou, Arthur Cecil Pigou, was a professor of economics at Cambridge. He first posed the idea that you uh, determine the quality of a, of a country by how much large the share of the poor in total income is. And giving people who the poor more money will increase the welfare of the whole uh, whole nation because you know you uh, the utility of extra money to the rich was less than it would be to the poor. So give them uh, uh, one pound from the rich and give it to the poor, and so the rich won't suffer that much. The poor would be very rich. So that is how the politics went in the area. And then what I determined, then what I argue is that unfortunately Purdue was sidetracked by what came to uh, on about uh, unemployment. So I I surveyed the debate about Keynes and how Keynes and the monetarists fought, and everybody lost in 2008 when there was a complete collapse of, of financial markets. So now I'm saying now the path is again clear to do what we what we do on the do build an economics which actually respects the poor, which respects the claims of the poor, which where redistribution is good. So. My book is basically a, a combination of how economic theory started uh, with uh, uh, Marcus and uh, Ricardo, how the political movement to increase the franchise in, in England uh, sort of took, took place, and how in a, about a hundred or so years, we finally got universal franchise. Only when universal franchise is there, that policymaker turn their attention to redistribution. Redistribution doesn't come from, from anywhere else. It has to come from politics of, of, of a country. So this is this is my this is my uh, gist of my uh, my book. Yes sir. So now if you could go into a little specifics uh, and it's a very fascinating read because it almost read like a thesis that you have written uh, I wanted to ask you, your book highlights how economics have sidelined the interests of the poor historically. And as you rightly mentioned, uh, Adam Smith was a nice guy. And we have seen after that, there has been a shift. Could you elaborate what were the historical factors that led to the shift? Well, most important, so inflation thing happened round about the decade in which the French Revolution took place. 1789 is a date when the, the Bastille, Bastille prison is, is broken and, be, and then the French Revolution starts. Seven, uh, 1785 to 1790 was the inflationary period. So when the French Revolution happened, the fear of the mob, fear that the, 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 the people out there in order, established the order of the lords and the, and, and the dukes and the people and the king, and take over power. That fear of anarchy crossing over from France to England, and there's only 22 miles of, of sea between them. So the, I, the fear of the French Revolution strengthened the argument that this sort of reactionary economic, reactionary political economy was the right message. If, if the landlords were to maintain power in the parliament, they must not give more money to the poor. So in a sense, and of course, then, 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 then the, uh, 
when Napoleon became uh, the king of France and fought a war, England won in Waterloo. And of course, the English political economy became dominant across the world because England was, as it were, the most powerful empire uh, in Europe as well as across the world. So the English language, English uh, uh, political economy became much more popular than French or German or Italian. And so all across the world, economics is basically how the British economists uh, sort of uh, shaped it. And the way the British economy shaped it was very much determined by the origins in the narrow political perspective in terms of power that there was. So this is a, in a sense, most people think uh, in sort of what they call vulgar Marxism, you know, economic difference politics. Marx didn't quite say that, but that's what people think. I'm turning it over and saying, no, it's the political economy, the, the way the politics, the way the uh, decision makers are elected, are chosen, that actually determines what they do think about, you know, because they don't think about their own interest. Uh, so, so the pandemic exposed uh, exposed similarities and challenges faced by people across different economic strata, from the richest to the poorest countries. Can you discuss how specific groups such as women, early uh, elderly migrants, and those who working who were working away from home were disappropriately affected during the pandemic? Well, you remember when in India, the first lockdown was announced by Prime Minister Modi. What we saw on television was people walking from Delhi to Bihar. You know, people who had nothing else to do, they just had, there no way, it should have been easy to say, that, okay, you are here, you're unemployed, it's an emergency, so we will spend money on, on you. I'm giving an example of India because uh, the the Manrega for rural uh, rural people. So the people who were going because they only have their household. You know, they can't carry that claim they have to wherever they are working. So migrant labor. So, their children or the or their walk. And I sort of thought, yes, these things happen. And uh, nobody thought, well, how can we somehow create a, as I said before, an urban Manrega, some kind of unemployment benefit scheme or some kind of a, a charity or whatever you call it for the people who can't uh, have enough if they can't work. Now, see, that idea. Of course, India has a universal franchise and the governments are normally sort of redistributive. But again and again, you see, as I said, budget after budget, people's attention is focused on how much the middle class will pay in income tax. So that, that's a big, big thing. Or you know, what, what will happen to business and exports and imports. And we have to actually change our perspective not just India, everywhere, to valuing a society by the quality of life for all its people, all its people. And that is what I do in the later part of the book. Once I discuss the Keynes and, and monetarist controversy and all that, then I turn to some how we uh, impact society and how what, what we have to uh, do. And the thing is that there are two things, lives and livelihoods. You know, when we have to we have to provide livelihoods for people and ensure them a healthy long life. And so I've constructed a measure of a you know, the welfare of a society based on those two elements. And I give some mathematical formula, but that, that's not the important thing. Important thing is 
the, the thing, the quality of an economy has to be measured by how it caters to lives and livelihoods. And obviously, the problems of gender are, have to be addressed and, and old age and so on. So, that is, this is what I want to say that economics ought to be doing. Uh, sir, so you emphasize Adam Smith's ethical perspective on economics and how it was grounded in the social framework. Could yeah. you explain this framework and how and when this ethical foundation began to erode, especially the role of Thomas Malthus and David Ricardo? Well, you know, basically, it, it is, it's very interesting because most people have all sorts of false views about uh, uh, Adam Smith, because you know Adam Smith is oh the guru of free market and friend of the capitalists and all that, but you know and it's not easy to read it. It pays him again and again. I a lonely man, but very very clever from early on. People thought, and he writes a book in which he cares as much about the slaves in in. In, in American continent, you know, because, because Europeans are, uh, are, are exploring America and hiring England and Scotland. And, and, and again, again, he basically wants the wages to be adequate to take care of. Now, you see, I'm, I'm sorry about this. Uh, you know, so, in a sense, it is. Uh, the breadth of his vision, I mean, he's very critical of the East India Company, he's very critical of the Dutch East India Company, because although he has not traveled to India, he has, he has you know, you know about India and about China and about Indonesia to, to worry about the welfare of the people there. So he had this amazing universal uh, uh, sympathy and, and he expresses it. Whereas Marcus and Ricardo, are really concerned with the English society and their their class, whether their class would uh, prosper or not. So and Ricardo says at one stage, when I quote, that even if you take away 19 shillings out of a pound and give it to the poor, the condition won't improve. Obviously, he's not going to give away that much. It's only, it's only going to take one shilling away from him. Well, these kind of strong defenses that basically giving money to the poor is counterproductive. It's not in their own interest. You know, okay. he's basically defending the interests of the rich. You know, he was one of the richest men uh, in, in, in England at that time. He was a stockbroker and a landlord and all sorts. So I wanted to bring out the hidden motivation behind economic theory, which is normally thought, oh, this is value-free. The logical beauty of the card. Uh, and so I wanted to show that, no, it's, it's not, he's not really that, that great. Uh, well, some of his uh, theory, while elegant as theory, is based on his class interest. Uh, so, sir, in the book, you also mentioned uh, about John Me. Can you hear me? John Kent's idea dominated academia and policy making for several decades yeah. after that. How did his idea contribute to shaping the economic landscape over the period of time that we see the Keynes economic model dominating the economic force right now? Whatever we go into this policy making space, we heard just hear about his policies. Well, you see, one, one thing I show is that how Ricardo's ideas about redistribution led to uh, the basically the poor law. In, in, in one, after the first reform of voting, the middle classes got into uh, parliament a little bit. But their reform was to rationalize the same sort of thing. And they built what's called workhouses. So what they couldn't understand is how could an able-bodied man they were men, be unemployed. They didn't understand the way labor markets work in capitalism. So the idea was that no able-bodied man should be unemployed and free to roam around. So they all had to live in workhouses to make quite sure that their movements and their uh, activities are limited 
because they had to be maintained by public public funds. So the, the man and his family had to live in a workhouse, and basically they were waiting as soon as they could release him. And, and so Charles Dickens has a very dramatic uh, uh, description of how bad work you know, this, this, this workhouse is there. So in a sense. Because you know, from the time of Mahatma Gandhi, it was the late feudalism. Suddenly, industrial revolution takes place. Labor markets become become urban and and and, and very very fluid. They just couldn't understand that unemployment could could uh, could persist. So, if you were unemployed, it was your fault, and therefore you had to be as well incarcerated uh, so that you don't go out and do something uh, uh, you know, something which is a Away from the interest of these people, so that and then from there on, from the 1840s, from then until about the beginning of 20th century, the same law against the poor uh, is only in the first decade of 20th century that uh, Sidney Webb and uh, Beatrice Webb, who were socialists, socialist couple, they argued about how the poor law should be reformed. And that was also the first time when a government, a liberal government, decided to redistribute income by taxing land and giving more money to the poor. And that's when a whole whole politics changed because uh, suddenly redistribution became a major theme of British politics, and people and, and economists started discussing about poverty, measuring poverty, measuring income distribution, and things like that. So until then, there was, there was no interest in redistribution. But once you have, uh, uh, you know, well, all male adult franchise things became. But the full franchise did not come till 1928 when women vote vote on the same uh, basis as men do. So England did not become a democracy until 1928. That is my view. You have to have universal franchise to have a democracy. And India very, I would say very specially, upon its independence, India guaranteed universal franchise to all its citizens. So that's a remarkable achievement. Even France did not have it until 1946. So you know, in, in, that, that's a great, great quality of, of the Indian, Indian independence movement. I actually wanted to take this a little ahead since you're mentioning this, and you brought this concept of maximum welfare, which was articulated by. Arthur Sisubi go, uh, and you emphasize yeah. how the share of the poor in total income are very yeah. is a very important theme in your book. So, how does this perspective also challenge the traditional economic measurement and definition of wealth? Yeah, you, you see, basically, what what happened? People had moved over to the idea of consumer utility, marginal utility. How uh, you could say income the the benefit of income was measured by how much consumption was possible and consumption gave utility to people. So income led to uh, utility. And therefore, if you could add up the utility of each individual or each family, the total utility of the society would be the welfare of the society. And so people said, well, because by theory, in theory itself, it says, Utility increases, but each additional bit of income gives you less utility than the one before. So the marginal utility declines, while the total utility increases. So I'll say from 10 to 12, but then from 12 to 13 and a half. You know, so each each. So he basically said, if you measure the utility of everybody, then you realize. That giving money to the poor, uh, uh, taking money from the rich and giving it to the poor will increase the total utility in the society. This was this was, this was a big, big uh, revolution in a sense in the second decade of the 20th century after the First World War. And his book, Economics and Welfare, became a very important book. Now, then the counter argument started. Uh, by Lionel Robbins, which I, I described. He said, no, no, utility, you can't compare utility of rich and the poor. 
you can't compare it to the deal between any other, between any two individuals because utility is not comparable. Well, how much pleasure I get from listening to Beethoven or, or listening to Kabir as a classical music, you can't say that you will, uh, that money should be taken away from you and given it to the poor to buy more bread because the pleasure I get from listening to classical music would be much bigger than what the poor man would get from bread. Then the philosophical argument say that uh, utility was not uh, aggregable, not compar comparable between different people. So interpersonal comparison, comparison utility was not theoretically sound. That's a very powerful counter argument against people. I redistribution is not good in, in it because you can't you can't compare the rich and the poor. Now it's a very strange idea because one one uh, trend in society has been greater equality or lesser inequality of people across the board. But this one argument, no, no, it doesn't it doesn't apply in terms of income distribution, and therefore we must go back to the original uh, idea. So it is that all this is political and economic interaction. Uh, I I did and it is. All these things were known. I just wove it into a single story. That's what I have done. I, I think I think Robin was wrong. I'm I'm, I'm a redistributed person. So, uh, I, I, but you know, it's, in in economics there is still a debate about uh, highly theoretical and so on. But there is behind theory there is politics. And so this brings me to my next question too. Yeah, your book highlights to uh, the shift of economic fo focus from redistribution to full in employment, particularly in the context of 20th century. How did this shift shape economic policies and attitude towards the poor? As I point out, both these theories, Pigou and Cambridge, they're both from Cambridge. They're from the same college. Okay, Pico was somewhat senior to, to Kate. And it is a, there was unemployment was a big problem by, by the late 20s and early 1930s. And so Kate worked this very revolutionary argument, of, of which there was not an, in economic theory any theory of this. Uh, that what determines full employment in an economy? You know, how 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 do you cure unemployment? And he, uh, he had the idea that basically don't worry about budget deficits and things like that. If you pay the unemployed some money, then the fact that they will spend the money will lead to more employment. And therefore the multiplier effect will take place. So if you want to cure unemployment, have that kind of uh, idea that uh, budget deficits are a good thing and so on. Now, it is obviously very much uh, kind of friendly to, to people's idea, but people somehow in Cambridge had this big fight. Forget about people. They go to Keynes and worry about Keynes. So income distribution is not important. It's full employment which is important. Just ensure full employment and good income distribution will follow. So this led to, uh, you know, Keynes completely trying. Everybody forgot about people. Keynes come to triumph and Keynes in economics was a dominant economic, you know, certainly, certainly in my, my uh, career, more or less from the <clears throat> early 1940s to, 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 to the end of the uh, 20th century, Keynes in economics was a big thing. And then, of course, that was the reaction against Keynes in economics from people who said, oh, it will cause inflation and, and full employment is bad. It's the same kind of argument which was being made against people, but it's a different form. I.e., if you have full employment, then it will lead to inflation because workers will demand higher wages and so on. So the same battle was fought in terms of Keynes and Friedman, monetarism and so on. And that whole debate more or less occupied the second half of 20th century. And it's only in 2008 when there was a complete collapse of uh, to the stock markets and things like that. That we had a the, Keynes was supposed to eliminate depression and unemployment. 
unemployment came back when that whole whole thing collapsed. So, not so much in India, but 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 in the, in the developed countries. So that gave an opportunity to open up the other questions, the older questions of economics about poverty and about incomplete distribution and so on. Because what what happened was, despite full employment for many years, you know, for for 25 to 30 years. Income distribution did not improve that much. You know, so it is a Keynesian economics was not enough to, to lead to a better income distribution. And therefore, uh, it is necessary but not sufficient. So my idea is you have to go and to combine Keynesian to go and have full employment as well as in the region. So I spent my last three chapters are given on that. And one of the arguments I explore is basic income. How people should be given a basic income. Whoever is a citizen has to a certain minimum income. Every voter gets, gets so much money. And I especially emphasize that women do a lot of unpaid work in society. In every society, women do a lot of unpaid work. And they look after the children, they look after health care for the family, they do housework, they cook, you know, they sew, they, they, they but, but they're not paid for it. And we live with this unpaid work as if it, it is natural. So our time has now come to value unpaid work uh, and reward it from the public uh, budget. And that would that would be just like Ken said, it would lead to better spending and, uh, and, and more prosperity. If you give money to the poor, they're not going to, they're not going to sold it away. They're going to spend it. So money given to the poor comes back to the economy. Money given to the rich may be saved or they may buy buy some you know assets and so on. But money given to the lower income people always comes back all of it into the economy. So using that idea, one can construct a welfare state with basic income as a, as a democratic right. Actually, I want to slightly touch upon what you mentioned. Uh, in your previous answer about the financial crash of 2008 and the subsequent response that favored the rich in an intriguing respect to touch upon in the book as well. So could you discuss how this even exa- exemplified the dynamics between the economic policies, wealth interest and the well-being of the poor? After the Second World War, when they had to, you see, until, until the Second World War, there was something called gold standard. Money was wrote by uh, how much gold was in the coffers of any country, and you had to have money. Uh, you had to money such that if somebody presented a currency note, you had to give them gold. Uh, okay, so that was good. and that that was that took care of infl- uh, in, uh, inflation was very rare in those days until about 1930s, and then of course we moved from the gold standard to what we now call fiat money and so on, inflation resulted and so on. So the idea in the monetary fund was that you know there wasn't all that much gold gold in America away from Europe because America was a was a, was a country and it could fight the Second World War without disturbing its economy too much. Anyway, America had all the gold and so America was a determined. And they determined that basically the way the way IMF would be constructed would be as hostile to public spending, which may lead to budget deficits, which may lead to inflation and so on. So again, the whole IMF logic was built on the idea that a country has to be always careful with its uh, economic uh, budget and so on and try and maintain balanced budget, try and maintain a stable currency and so on. All those things are actually the same kind of message that Ricardo and Marcus were given. They just come in a slightly different disguise. So basically, the, the construction of the post war financial uh, mechanism was very much reflecting that kind of, uh, sort of conservatism about uh, people, the country spending money and so on. 
So the poorer countries did not get as much out of an IMF World Bank kind of thing uh, as they should have. Now, you know, in India, India always had a problem. Remember when uh, Mr. Gandhi had to devalue the rupee and things like that. You, you, you will not know all this. But in India had to struggle with the uh, IMF in, in early days. So, now it is all right. Now India, India is good. Sufficient foreign exchange uh, and so on. Even even the UK had had to look after how stable the pound was, and if the pound depreciated, they had to have unemployment. They had to you know uh, slam down the brakes on the economy and unemployment. So unemployment was a way of fighting inflation, and so on. So all those things were basically constructed to be hostile to the poor. And uh, so that logic state uh, came, came to as it were reshaped into a kind of Ricardian logic of being hostile to the poor. You know, don't, basically, budget deficits are basically uh, caused by the poor, cut welfare spending, and you know, that would be a good thing. The cutting welfare spending is again hostile to the poor. And, these this ideas have been very deeply rooted. And I'm saying that uh, we know where they came from and we have to kind of go away from them and evaluate the, the quality of an economy in terms of, as I said, lives and livelihoods. What really matters is not the budget and deficit at all. What matters is, are people in a country having a good life? Have they got good livelihoods? And that would be the way to construct it now. Sir, your book also draws attention to the role of globalization and the rise of East Asia and China in influencing economic dynamics in the West. How did this global shift impact economic policies? Can you please do that? Well, you know, in a sense, the, the miracle, uh, in, uh, there are two miracles. First of all, the idea that there were newly independent countries Newly independent from colonial rule, and they had they were a special cluster of men, and some of their economics should be discussed on a different basis from the economics of, of uh, rich countries. And so I point out that uh, the work by Arthur Lewis on surplus labor, how surplus labor had to be converted into employed labor, and things like that. And so that whole idea of uh, uh, changing a poor economy into a rich economy, the development of the poor was, was only after the Second World War a big subject. And in, in, in India, of course, it was, uh, it was one other thing on which you not have to spend a lot of time. Now, in that, in that context, the question was on one hand, people said, oh, we'll be going to socialism, communism, or whatever it is. But communism was more a political thing than an economic thing. The communist countries like Soviet Union did not economically prosper. Of course, they, they hit their uh, misery. China was the first country with a communist politics, but it, it, it sort of decided after the death of Mao Zedong that the way to do is to develop the economy, business, import capital, import capital is what we did, and grow the economy. A man called Deng Xiaoping, uh, who succeeded Mao as leader of China. He, and I, I point out that what, what happened was that during the, during the oil, uh, oil price, oil shock, oil price shock of 1973, inflation was rampant in developed countries. So a lot of industries went from away from Europe and America to Asia. So South Korea and, and Taiwan and Singapore prospered because they more or less said, okay, we will have a government policy, but we will just get our big businessmen together with the government to, to, to develop the economy, which India didn't do. But that's another story. So the Asian countries prospered by inviting capitalism. That, I'm, in my view, is what gave Deng Xiaoping the idea that if China has to develop, China will have to go that sort of capitalist way. So China became a communist capitalist economy. 
because they, they opened up the, the, the economy to business when coming from outside investing or lending money. And it was the fastest growing 20, 25 year period in the history of economics, which China demonstrated. I was in China in 1973, when it was still poor. Uh, but, you know, after Mao died in 1975, suddenly 1980 onwards, Chinese economy is basically, they had a lot of labor and they were putting all the labor to product to work. They, they stopped having communes. They went back to private property in agriculture. And in a while, there's a lot of, lot of government ownership. It was government ownership with borrowed capital from, from private sector. So that was a big innovation. And China's example showed other developing countries that this is the way to go. And India, of course, came a little bit late. India came after after 91 when uh, uh, Latim Rao and, and Mohan Singh ran a government which they opened up the economy and they were business friendly. So basically, the idea was, you know, everybody thought in, in 1950s, 60s, oh, there's something called socialism, state ownership of business production. That was a path to growth. China proved no. You, you may have a socialist politics, but you need to have a conservative economy. And so that is a miracle in which China and, and, and India, India has brought that. In India, there was a great suspicion of foreign capital coming into the country. There's, oh, this East India Company back. With, with uh, Nansim Rao and Manmohan Singh, the economy opened up. And now we, we, we are not, we're not afraid of, of you know, foreign companies coming and manufacturing in India or you know, uh, uh, investing in India. That whole change was very much led by China's example that here is a communist country willing to go the capitalist way. So it, uh, it, it's a, it, I'm not gone very much into that argument, but China's growth uh, strategy was very much important. And China was, as it were, following what happened in South Korea and Singapore and Taiwan and so on. So the recipe was go go the standard uh, economics where the one is basically get capital to, to, to get growth. Well, where do you get your capital from? Uh, you know, doesn't matter. Just get it and then your economy will grow. And that is why China, China leaped up between 1980 and uh, sort of 2010 and became one of the leading economies. So again, so India learned that it's possible. We can do that as well. And so this is, so the, from that point of view, the whole uh, subject of development, development economics, as was trans transformed by what, uh, what China uh, did. So the COVID-19 uh, pandemic emphasized the need to prioritize lives and livelihoods in the economic decision making. So how yes. can policymakers strike a balance between economic growth and social welfare, especially in a time of crisis? Well, you see, the, the lives and livelihood question was very much uh, inspired by the pandemic. In the pandemic was the first time in my life as an economist that both demand and supply collapsed. You know, normally when it came to the economics, uh, the, you know, in a sense, somehow uh, there was unemployment because people were not able to. Uh, uh, demand was there, but there was not any supply to create income. Here, people could not consume because they could not go out and associate with other people. They had to be isolated and they couldn't go out to work. They could not either go out to either work or to consume. And so both demand reduced and supply reduced. And there was a paradox. What, how do you think about an economics? So idea was, of course, we had to save lives. You know, we were basically big, how do you do vaccination or social distancing and all those things to save and extend lives. But then we also had to say, well, how do we get a livelihood? And one of the things that happened everywhere, especially in the UK where I live, so on, they decided help with budget deficit, 
basically the idea you have to give people money, you know, they call it furlough payment. You we are giving you money because we know you can't work, it's not your fault, you can't work. Here is some money to spend. And the idea was if, if you give money to, to people, they'll spend it in the form, it'll come back to come back to the government because the government will collect taxes on consumption and so on. So the lives and livelihoods were deeply connected uh, in, in a concrete way. I mean, we know in abstract they are connected. But economics had had to face the question of how to save lives and then how to how to maintain livelihoods. So I thought ultimately what the pandemic showed that the, the true way to measure welfare is what we were doing in the pandemic, looking up to lives and livelihoods. And so I was able to take that idea of human development, uh, which which I have I had worked on in the 1990s with, with the UNDP. And I said, look, I can adapt the human development idea to this idea of lives and livelihoods. The human development takes care of so, uh, combined uh, life expectancy, education, of uh, children and income in a single measure. I said, no, what you do is not life expectancy, but expected lifetime remaining in anybody's life. So each person has given their age as so much future number of years to come. So we have to lengthen that. And then, of course, we have to uh, make quite sure that income, the per capita income, but the way to distribute it. Because either your total income may go of, of the country, GNP, or per capita income, but it is not distributed. So we have to say, well, okay, ma'am, the per capita income of the country is very high, but what will I get out of it? So I, I combine that. And that, and then, of course, the question of health. I didn't want to live long. I want to have a healthy life. So one measure is how many are expected healthy life are left in the population, and how is normally an income per capita income adjusted for income inequality? One can one can say this is your chance of getting uh, that portion of per capita income. So I combine those three things to construct a, a welfare measure, which is sort of in in, in the spirit of Peru, uh, but uh, inspired by the pandemic. I call it a live the livelihood function because that's an easy way to remember it. Right, sir. So your assertion that poverty is not solely about the amount of food consumed uh, challenges exactly. conventional def uh, definitions. How can a broader understanding of poverty contribute to reshaping economic policies and fostering greater equality? Yeah, you know, first of all, you know, in a sense, uh, um, the, the, the notion that always maybe Carter had that the wage of the worker depended upon how much it cost to make the bread, uh, bread which feed them. You know, what's called labor theory of value is really the thing is how much labor is uh, needed to, to manufacture the bread in a broader sense the food packet that the poorest person consumes. Because that enables him to work. It's all about men. So the value of labor time was the time required to reproduce that labor. I from day to day then getting out work. So the idea is very narrow. How much does it cost society to give you the bread that that you in terms of labor time? That's the value of your labor time. Now, that idea basically in the poverty that debate came. The same idea was basically what is the amount of calories people need uh, to be to be not poor. And so people have written in India how, you know, what, what was the 15 rupees or whatever it was. And with it, you could buy dinner. So my view is that, that and, and not just my view, but that's the whole different debate about it. That it is not just eating. Uh, which, is, which is a sense of life. You have to feel you are part of society, that you are like other people, that you can do things. I mean, you know, you, life is not just, just about eating and surviving. Life is about you know, raising families or taking take part in social social activities. I mean, if let's say I'm I'm uh, 
disabled. Suppose I I can't walk. Now, for my living, I need a minimum amount of money for my transport. It's as important as my eating that I'm able to move around, or I I may have uh, I I may have other peculiar problems. Let's say I may have illness which makes it impossible for me to have this kind of standard bread and bread and butter. So how are you going to enhance the quality of my life to a certain minimum level? And that may be more than just food consumption of calories and things like that. So we ought to study how the poor live and how the people just above poverty never live. You know, people don't think about poor. And transhumanism, again, we can redistribute it in such a way that everybody has a certain minimum kind of uh, possibility of living a social life, not just surviving from day to day by eating. There's more to life than just eating all the time. And so we have to ask, ask that question. And I give an example of other people who have written about it. Professor Ramat Sen has written about it, a man called Peter Townsend was a sociologist. He had a very simple idea. He listed certain kind of standard meals. And he said, you know, how often do you have this kind of food in a week? You know, and this is what normally people are having, like, you know,